you shared some personal things regarding your yeah. family history and yeah. the way they could relate to refugees coming to yeah. America for opportunity, liberty. I'd like to go down the personal path just a sure. little bit more. So yeah. you you worked in Jordan for a yeah. little bit, um, yeah. vetting and helping uh, refugees get settled for That's the United right. Nations. And then later you returned to the Middle East and you worked as an operative for the Central Intelligence Agency. How did those experiences shape the way you see the refugee crisis? That's a great question. It, you know, what I've learned in working both in the humanitarian space and in the national security space is that humanitarian crises and national security are not separate things. They're not, they, they shouldn't be categorized separately. And I think a lot of people do that. And I remember I, I used to be a senior advisor on national security topics in Congress. I remember when I was in discussions for that job, I was asked, um, do you think that solving terrorism is more of a, is it a humanitarian issue, a governance issue, or is it more of a military issue we need to attack and defeat and kill the terrorists? And, and I thought, well, this is, this is interesting that the, the question is set up so that it's either or. It's actually both. I mean, national security issues and human, humanitarian issues are part of the same picture in my mind. And that's, that's what, what one of my primary takeaways was from having worked in the humanitarian space and in the national security space. And so when I, for example, see that there are over 5 million Syrian refugees now, and that doesn't include the internally displaced people that we spoke about earlier, the IDPs, that's another several million inside Syria. Uh, and they, these are people living like refugees, they're just still in Syria. Uh, when I look at that, I see a humanitarian issue, but I also see a national security issue. Why? Because half of those people, as I think you pointed out, earlier are children and these are children that are adolescents they're not they're being undereducated they're not in school or not in school enough they're being many times they're not being nourished the way they need to be they're they're at risk for being exploited and then radicalized as well and so in an environment where in a place that's flush with terrorists the last thing you want is a whole generation of youth that isn't in school and that isn't being, you know, isn't being um, brought up uh, in a healthy way. And so this is both a humanitarian issue and a national security issue. They're part of the same picture. We need to care about these giant refugee problems, especially in the Middle East. If, if not for moral reasons, which I think are valid and should be very powerful for us, uh, for national security reasons. Now in the past you've spoken on amping up the ideological attack on, on terrorism, on these radicals. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by an ideological warfare? Yeah. I mean that we have to win the battle of ideas. So the war on terror, it happens on the battlefield and in the dark alleys. And I was a part of that as, a, as an operations officer with the CIA. Um, but it, we also need to win, the, just as we did in, in the Cold War with communism, we need to show that our ideas, our, the principles on which our society has been founded and, and, and on which it thrives, what are those? Those are freedom and diversity, you know, principles of individual liberty uh, and, in, in, and self rule and the empowerment of people. Um, we need to continue to make the case to the world uh, and especially to those uh, in the Middle East who might be vulnerable to radicalization by uh, radical Islamists, we need to make the case to, the, to them that liberty and freedom and the tolerance that needs to come with that is a better way. And, and I don't think we've been very good at that. Uh, Al-Qaeda and I, especially ISIS has been so good at digital media and social media and uh, it's very well accompanied their success on the battlefield and they've been able to merge those two so that they recruit a lot of people. Um, you know, so we just need to be better about, about fighting the battle of ideas. What is that means it mean it means engaging on social media it means helping our Muslim par partners and our Muslim allies in the region uh, make the case to their their fellow Muslims that um, that that's not true Islam that's not the kind of Islam that that should be advanced or practiced. Uh, we need to do better coordinating efforts within the US government. We have one agency doing one thing and another doing another thing. We need them to be better organized. I think we need the effort to be better funded, but we also need 
need to do a better job. And there are efforts underway. I'm not suggesting that nothing is happening. There are international efforts uh, that we play a role in, but I just think they need to be stronger and better orchestrated. If we could jump back again to your personal experiences, were there any defining moments for you or key individuals, reg refugees that you personally met that have, have impacted you in the way you look at things? Yes, absolutely. So there's one in particular. Of, uh, I worked with a, a lot of refugees when I was in Jordan, and uh, many of them, most of them were resettled. If they were resettled, they were resettled to Europe um, or to Canada. Uh, but And I don't know fully where all of them ended up going. But, um, but the one that I know who came to the United States, he was a young man who had, uh, he was a, an Iraqi. The refugees I worked with were Somali and Syrian and Rocky mostly. And uh, he was in college and was seeing the kind of torture and abuse that Saddam Hussein was carrying out against the Iraqi people. Terrible things. I mean, I could, if we had more time, I would share stories. Um, so he opposed Saddam Hussein and he, he printed out leaflets that called for the opposition for people to rise up against Saddam Hussein. And he distributed them around, left them around his university campus. And the intelligence service, Saddam's intelligence service, discovered that he and a couple of friends had been responsible for this. And so they arrested him and they took him to prison and they tortured him. And while he was in prison, he witnessed horrible torture of other people too. And he, as he was being tortured, he witnessed the torture of other people. Eventually they let him out. I think his family paid a bribe and he was let go. That's how things work in dictatorships. And he then went into hiding and his family raised more money and they paid a smuggler to take him out to the desert of Iraq, uh, headed towards Jordan. And uh, it's just a remarkable story. And he then, the, the smuggler dropped him in the middle of the desert, pointed, in the, pointed him in the right direction, and he just walked for days. Toward Jordan, towards Jordan. And eventually he got there. He could have died doing that, but he crossed the border in the desert and was discovered by some basically nomads in the Jordanian desert. And they, they took him and they brought him to safety. And ultimately he made his way to Amman where I interviewed him and I was responsible for beginning the vetting process with him. And we had many long interviews where I challenged his story to make sure that it all held together. Um, and, uh, I had already worked for the CIA for some time before I was doing that. I took a year off and I was then there working for the UN. And so I knew a lot about Iraq and a lot about the environment and I could, I could tell if stories made sense or not. And his story checked out and I assessed him to be uh, a good young man, somebody who could be then further vetted by whatever country. And eventually the United States said, okay, we, we think we want to vet this guy. So they spent a year and a half vetting him and he came to the United States and now he works with the US military training special forces before they go out on counterterrorism missions and that's that's a that's a story that's a, a typical American story and, and a typical refugee story uh, I think it's an outstanding one it's one in which somebody fought for freedom where they were they fled when they were abused because they wanted their basic universal rights. And they're one of the few that made it to the United States. And he is now more patriotic than many Americans and doing more to protect our liberty and our freedom here in the United States and the cause for freedom around the world than most Americans were, will ever do. And I think that's something I wish, I wish more Americans would know that story. They will hopefully after watching this video. Uh, but, uh, but this is why, this is one reason why refugees are so important to this country.